Almost two years ago, I made a multi-part episode about the dark times in American automotive history, the Malaise era. A time of gas crises, new regulations and emission controls. In that series, I left out some of the other bad cars that were made during that time. And it's time to make that right. Welcome everyone to episode 49 of the Automotive History series, which is technically an extra addition to episode 20 that's about the Malays era. And so how I mismanaged this episode, so we're going to look at some more delicious, malicious Malays era mismanagement. Here is to even more Malays, trashing 70s American Luxor barges, here is to the last episode. To quickly refresh your memory, in America you had the big three automakers, the Ford Motor Company, General Motors and the Chrysler Corporation, and then you had AMC, the last independent car maker. But let's start with Ford, because why not? I have burned Ford before, or really they burnt themselves, quite literally, with cars like the Pinto. A car that could burst into flames if it was hit from the right or, well, really the wrong angle. Although this story gets much worse when you see how Ford handled the case. I then went on to criticize the Ford Granada, which by some is regarded as the most Malays era vehicle, riding on a 15 year old platform with pathetic performance numbers not seen since the 1920s. And here is where I want to pick up the story. See, in traditional American fashion, if you develop one car, then you spread it across all your divisions and rebadge them. Such is the case with the Granada, a semi-luxurious mid-sized car. By 1975, the middle-class division Mercury also received a reworked Granada called the Mercury Monarch, an even more upscale Granada. But Mercury offered two versions of the Monarch, as you could also upgrade it to the Grand Monarch Gia, an even more, more upscale Granada. And the Monarch Gia, oh, that's like a 70s wet dream. Luxury accoutrements everywhere, leather trim on every possible surface, acres of vinyl roofs, chrome badges everywhere, white wall tires, spoke wheels, and an LCD clock. Oh. This car was essentially the holy grail of having a luxury car in a mid-size or compact form within Ford, as the luxury division Lincoln only offered aircraft carrier-sized battle cruisers. Or did they? These were the days that the compact European luxury cars and sports sedans like the Mercedes and BMWs were gaining ground in the US. And what did you know it? Two years later, in 1977, Ford's arch rival GM decided to downsize most of their models, including its luxury division Cadillac, and also launched a brand new car that was going to beat the Germans. The Seville. And to be fair, they didn't really beat the Germans, but the first generation Seville wasn't a bad car. By offering a compact luxury car, GM left Ford empty-handed, because the Lincoln division still strongly focused on traditional American luxury, meaning bigger is always better. And no matter how many design additions you throw at it, the Mark series personal luxury cars may eventually start to lose their appeal by being so gargantuan, wallowy and fuel inefficient. Ford had to act quickly and had to come up with some sort of compact luxury car that would compete with the Germans, but even more so with the Cadillac Seville. A compact Lincoln. Hmm. In the early 70s, Ford played around with the idea of bringing one of the European models over to the States, in this case the European Ford Granada, kind of like the flagship model of Ford of Europe at the time. They would bring over the car from Germany and change the design for a more American style, with a classic Lincoln grille and quad headlights, almost like a mini Rolls Royce. The 1973 Lincoln Gia Mark I would be a true European Lincoln. But other than a quick design study, upper management decided to not push the idea of a compact Lincoln any further. And oh how times have changed a few years later. So Lincoln was once again in need of a compact luxury sedan, and Ford had a plan. They would take the most luxurious version of the Granada platform, so the Mercury Grand Monarch Gear, scrap it and bring it over to the Lincoln division. They'd take the Mercury, give it even more equipment, the full brougham razzle-dazzle, the Lincoln waterfall grille and rear fake spare tire hump, 
and let it stand out even more, giving it a clear coat paint, disc brakes all around, and it was the first car to have halogen headlamps installed in these new rectangular headlights. And voila, in record time, Lincoln had a compact luxury Seville fighter, which also was the most expensive model in the lineup. Take that, Cadillac! But Cadillac laughed, and so did the rest. Ladies and gentlemen, let me re-elect of what I think is the malaisiest car of all time, the 1977 Lincoln Versailles, or if you're French, Versailles. This was not a baby Lincoln, mm -mm. this was a Fort Granada reaching peak brougham. The most striking aspect of the new small Lincoln is its similarity to the Mercury Monarch and Ford Granada. They didn't change the body. They didn't change anything underneath the car. They barely changed the interior, but what they did manage to increase was the retail price, and triple it. Lincoln Versailles, the final edition of what's essentially a 1960 Ford Falcon. But wait till we get to the engine specs. The Versailles was offered with two engines, both suffering from serious asthma attacks, better known as the emission regulations. You either had the Ford 302, a 302 cubic inch or 4.9 liters, making a whopping 133 horsepower, or the Ford Windsor, 351 cubic inch or 5.8 liters, that, get this, made 135 horsepower. It's downright an achievement to extract two more horsepower from almost a liter of extra displacement. I dare to say that I can extract more horsepower from my own farts! Now, the Versailles wasn't the sales success Lincoln had hoped for. Whoa, what an eye-opener. Cadillac managed to handsomely outperform Lincoln, and after four years and only 50,000 units sold, the French palace fairy tale was over and around this time, the new downsized regular Lincoln models would arrive. As you can see, the American car makers strongly focused on the ever-growing influx of European cars, and so it wouldn't take long after the coup d'etat of Versailles <laughs> French joke, that Ford was willing to try it again. This time, the company would look overseas at the European division. How original! What better way is to beat the European competition by importing your own European cars back into the US? And so Ford had done that before. In the early 70s, the company imported a German Ford Capri and sold it as just as Capri in the States, through Mercury Lincoln dealers. And for a while, everything went well, until the declining value of the dollar made importing the Capri a costly operation. Among other reasons, the car was scrapped and replaced by a new model based on the American Mustang II. With the risk of captive import turning unprofitable because of the changing dollar value, Ford had learned its lesson and was destined to not expose itself to the same risk again. By the mid-80s, Ford had this luminous idea to import some of its European models and was destined to expose itself to the same risk again. Ford chose the European Ford Scorpio and the Ford Shara. Now, these were not a bad choice. Much like their American cousin the Taurus, both the Scorpio and the Shara were quite revolutionary at the time they came out. They featured new and radical streamlined design, and were generally seen as fun to drive with some peppy engines and didn't guzzle on gas. American Ford imported these two models, but decided to not take the Capri approach by just selling them without a brand name. No, Ford decided to make an entirely new brand out of it, along with all the bells and whistles that come along with it. Initially, a separate line of dealerships was planned, but ultimately deemed too expensive. The cars were then shoved into Lincoln Mercury dealers, because hey, if you can sell overstuffed town cars to the elderly, then sure as hell you can also sell European hot hatches to the young urban professionals, right? Merker! Oh, sorry, Mercur! Uh, uh, no, wait, Mercur was the new name for the division. The German word for Mercury. Anyway, the Shara would be renamed the XR4TI, because GM, and Scorpio remained the Scorpio. Some time, effort and money was spent to set up this brand, but to no avail. Ford had modest sale projections for this new brand, but even these modest projections were too high. 15 to 20,000 units a year, but in reality almost 25,000 units, but that took two years and was quickly dropping. Dealers had a good year if they managed to sell more than three. What went wrong? 
The official reason for Ford to discontinue the brand is the new strict safety laws, even more strict than European laws, which would mean that the cars had to be changed to meet the requirements. This was deemed costly for a car that wasn't selling anyway, and much like the Etzel affair 30 years prior, the division was scrapped after just 5 years. But there was a lot more going on. What did we learn today? Mistake number 1. If you've had negative experience with importing European models in the past, like the Capri, because they were the victim of the fluctuating international currency exchange rates, what makes you think it will definitely succeed this time? Because the Mercure brand suffered from the exact same situation like the Capri did. At one point, the Mercure Scorpio was as expensive as the Lincoln Town Car, but didn't really look like it could justify that. Mistake number 2. Don't automatically assume that as soon something is from Europe or Germany, then oh, mm, oh, it's from Germany, oh, it's a road hugging, an ultimate driving machine, oh, no foreign luxury, German efficiency, kann ich kaputt. No. Europe also has its fair share of basic economy cars. And although the Scorpio and especially the Shara were Ford of Europe's try at making an upscale luxury car, it doesn't really have the same image and level of luxury like a BMW or a Mercedes. So what makes you think that this would change as soon as the cars reach the American shores? Mistake number three. I mean, come on. It's the name. Why? Out of all available names, Mercure. I get it, it's German for Mercury, but doesn't that add to the confusion? Is this like a Mercury sub-label? Or is this a, a Mercury? Or is it Mercury spelled wrong? Why not import them under their own name and just add a little badge saying Ford of Europe? Why take a name that is so hard to pronounce by Americans? Dealership employees had to go on a two-week course to finally pronounce it right and also insisted that the customer would pronounce it the same way. What also doesn't help is adopting the XR40i name. Mercure XR40i. It just sounds like a dishwasher. I seriously bet that if you would call them the Fort Sauerkraut and the Fort Bratwurst, it would ring a lot more bells than Mercure. Let's move on to General Motors. Much how Ford screwed it up with the Pinto, GM managed to screw it up with the Chevrolet Vega. Although GM had some good intentions during its development, after a few years of selling the cars, six out of seven Vegas were subject of a recall. Trying to leave those dark times behind, GM decided to try again in making a compact and fuel-efficient economy car. And in order to do that, the car would be built from the ground up. A new platform, along with a new type of layout, front-wheel drive and a transversely mounted engine. Because, ooh, that's European. See, beneath the flashy chrome and futuristic style, American cars are pretty simple. Engine in the front, a lengthwise power to the rear, and suspension, preferably from the Stone Age. But this was about to change. GM wanted to make a compact and fuel-efficient car with great space utilization thanks to the compact front-wheel drive layout. A car that was with the times and would compete with the European and upcoming Asian models that had a similar approach. But the development of the car took place in tumultuous time. The development of what became known as the X platform was executed in a time when GM was struggling with all the new regulations regarding safety and emissions. Millions were spent on barely meeting the ever stricter requirements, and on top of that, the company had to find time and money to invest in this new platform. And although the company had some experience with front-wheel drive in the past, it was still out of the ordinary. The X platform was a rush job as were many of the new models in those days. And yet, by 1980, GM released a full lineup of models that, of course, were spread across all of its divisions. The cars were sold as the Pontiac Phoenix, the Olds Omega and the Buick Skylark. Naturally, luxury division Cadillac was left out of the picture. But the face of the whole program was Chevrolet with the Citation. And you know why they called it the Citation? Because it was such a fine car. In fact, it was such a fine car that it won Motor Trend's Car of the Year, so great. The cars came in numerous body styles, including the American approach of the European hatchback. The cars were a smash hit. It was the right car at the right time, preserving traditional big American vehicle values and preferences in a small and relatively fuel-efficient package. Space utilization, because of the modern drivetrain setup, was superb. 
and so the car sold rapidly in big numbers in its first year, 1980. But, as we have seen with the many other attempts before, the sales quickly dropped off when the car started to show the true identity. The X cars were plagued with numerous problems, the most apparent of which were the brakes. See, in the way the braking system was designed, the rear brakes had the tendency to lock up. And while your brakes lock up, well, you won't slow down as fast as you would have hoped. The cars also suffered from what was known as morning sickness. This means that if you started the car when it's cold, like early in the morning after a night of standing still, the steering wheel wouldn't move or move slowly, feeling like it had no power steering, but that would eventually solve as soon as the car warmed up. And shouldn't even be mentioned, in typical Malays era fashion, the car just suffered so much from overall quality problems and little issues. It was all just so... <sighs> Lousy and loose interior trim pieces, engine issues, transmission problems, windows that would fall into the door, electrical problems, early rusting, vague steering problems. You know, just your standard grocery list of Malays era motoring problems. All these problems came to light a year after GM managed to sell 800,000 of these. The US government started to interfere by forcing GM to recall the cars and fix some of the problems. GM reluctantly complied, but after two years only 300,000 of them were actually fixed. And as soon as the buying public got wind of it, they dropped the X-Cars faster than they would ever break without the rear brakes locking up. GM tried to update the car and pull a Chevy 2 by renaming him the Citation 2, but that was more like the Citation Story Part 2. By 1985, the X-Cars were discontinued. What started as GM's experience with front-wheel drive also started GM's long and great decline in the 1980s. Chevy Citation. You know why they called it a Citation? Because it was such a damn fine car. The last company I want to talk about is the Chrysler Corporation, and this takes place in the later 80s. Chrysler went quickly downhill some 10 years before, it stuck too long with the land yachts, and on top of that, it scrapped its reliable mid-sized models and replaced them with the new compacts that of course sucked in every Malays era way. By 1980, the company was almost bankrupt. But not according to this man. Lee Iacocca, the figurative father of the Ford Mustang and many other successes, eventually moved to Chrysler and revived the company with the K-platform and even an entirely new type of car, the minivan. Lee understood marketing and what people wanted, but he also liked to stick too long to things he thought were successful, all the way to the point of being overplayed. And a great example is the Lincoln Continental Mark III, a personal luxury car and also a all-time favorite of mine. The Mark III announced the Brougham decade and spawned many copies, all with their own classical grille and vinyl top. But by the mid to late 1980s, the Brougham had run its course. Either sharp lines or the first aerodynamic curves were popular, without the gaudy chrome tombstones and opera windows, but Lee was having none of that. See, the K cars were very successful, but were somewhat dull and lackluster in their appearance. Buyers started to lose interest and Lee wanted to bring the lineup back into the picture by performing the oldest trick in his book. Look at Europe, take something from it, and advertise it as something exclusive and luxurious. It worked by smashing a Rolls Royce grill on a T-Bird, so it'll work now. Lee Iacocca was fond of Italy and all the style it represented. He became friends with Alejandro de Tommaso, the man who launched the Tommaso Pantera GT car. And throughout the past, Chrysler had an on and off relationship with various Italian coach builders. Lee wanted to reintroduce that Italian magic on an ordinary and overused K car as some sort of last hurrah of the platform and called his friend, who now was the president of Maserati. The two men looked for a way to revive the Chrysler name with a halo model that would combine the best of both worlds. Italian style and craftsmanship and the reliability and uh, uh, reliability of uh, a Chrysler. Or, according to critics, not the combination of the best, but the worst of both worlds. The car would sit above the also planned Chrysler Baron, but because the development of this Halo model was plagued with endless discussions and arguments of what it should be, the development was delayed and so was the introduction. In the meantime, the Chrysler Baron was revealed, and a couple years later, the Halo car had also arrived. The 
Chrysler's TC by Maserati. No, this is not a LeBaron. Mm -mm. This looks, feels, smells, rides and sounds like an ordinary LeBaron with an extra porthole, but it isn't. Mm -mm. This is a full-blooded Italo-American car. Look at its logos. But in reality, you're looking at a car with a personality disorder. It's not a Chrysler per se, it's Chrysler's TC, whatever that means. Turbo Coupe, Touring Coupe, I, I don't know, I don't care. By Maserati, featuring engines outsourced from Mitsubishi. So is this a Chrysler, or a Maserati, or a Mitsubishi? It fooled no one. Chrysler only managed to sell 3,000 of them, partially because of the ridiculous retail price. It was overpretentious, in a way that the car looked almost identical to a regular, not all that special LeBaron, and shared engines that could also be found in a homely minivan. So much for making an exclusive and sporty GT car. It didn't matter how many Tridents you glued onto it. It was a Chrysler, not a Maserati, and people saw through this, and yet, According to Lee, it wasn't the fault of the car, but the fault of the marketing department. If they had done a better job, it could have been a success.